Good afternoon, everybody. Is this working? Pardon? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jeff Madigan. I'm a member of the Sydney Adventist Forum Committee, and it's my privilege to welcome you this afternoon to this meeting, which is going to be based upon the book that one of our friends, Neville Clouton, has written, and we're going to explore issues of architecture and the like um, with regard to our lives in general and its Im impact on the, on the church because we often have our experience with architecture in the building that we worship in. Um, Sydney Adventist Forum runs meetings of this nature from time to time and um, we appreciate your presence here today. Um, we do not have any meetings scheduled beyond this one yet, and so there's no announcements that I need to make regarding that. I've invited Dr John Cox to lead us in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet here this afternoon among friends. We adore you as our creator, but also as one who has shared his creativity with us and endowed us with the ability to create as well. We thank you for the creative talent that you have given to our friend Neville and for the opportunity this afternoon of considering the experiences of his life as he's recorded them in his book. We ask that you will bless him, bless us as we listen in your name we pray, amen. I believe that we can claim Neville Clouton as a local. Neville was born in Toronto and his family moved to Kurenbong while he was still in primary school so he could spend the remainder of his school education in the church schools which were then located on the Avondale campus here. An architectural degree at the University of Sydney followed, along with marriage to Noreen. Since then, they have led anything but a local life. Places Neville has worked or studied include the Sydney Opera House as a researcher and guide during its construction, Stockholm with a major architectural form, firm, the Ohio State University for his master's degree, and the University of 
Edinburgh, where he completed his PhD. The information I have says that Neville and Noreen drove from Ohio to Edinburgh via Mexico, Central America and Barcelona. I suspect something is missing there because nothing was said about the vehicle being amphibious. I'm sure you can join the dots. On return to Australia, Neville was a lecturer and senior lecturer at the University of Newcastle. It was toward the end of this time that we first became acquainted with Neville and Noreen when Donna taught piano to their daughter, Kirsten. Not long after this, Neville was appointed as the inaugural professor of architecture at Andrews University in Michigan. And as chair of the department, he gained accreditation for their new program. Later, Neville served as Dean of the College of Architecture and Design at the Lawrence Technological University, also in Michigan. The Cloutons have been spending their retirement locally in Wanji and Kurenbong. Neville also has creative skills in watercolour painting and entrepreneurial skills that enabled him to provide watercolour workshops on cruise ships. The rest of us have to pay to cruise or alternatively stay at home. This is a bare bones introduction. Some of the experience that fleshed out this journey are related in Neville's book that we plan to discuss here this afternoon. These combined experiences have brought experience with a capital E and Neville's reflection on them amounts to wisdom. Other members of the panel are as follows. Lauren Webb is an associate book editor with the Science Publishing Company. She will moderate the panel discussion and she was responsible for the editorial work on Neville's books. Lauren, you must have one of the best jobs in the world. When I read books, the, always, the authors always thank the editor and praise the work and say it's resulted in a much better project. And then they absolve the editor of any other issues by saying any faults that remain are mine entirely. So what a job. Praise, thanks and absolution. What more could you want? Another member of the panel is David Stafford. David is, has been known to us in this area for a long time. David is also an architect. Um, the last few years of his official working life were involved as the head of department or the chair of the department at the University of Newcastle. But he says he's been working in retirement harder than he's ever worked before and is currently working on projects for the Adventist Church for buildings in East Timor and India. So that sounds a challenge in itself. The remaining member of the panel is our church pastor, Norman Herlow, and I've already mentioned in my original remarks the link between church architecture and worship, and Norman is going to give a pastor's perspective on some of these issues today. I'd like you to welcome Neville and the other members of the panel. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, as Jeff has just mentioned, young Neville Cloughton was just commencing his architectural studies at the University of Sydney in 1957 when the winner of the Sydney Opera House Design Competition was announced. Danish architect Jorn Utzen took out the title, but uh, the appreciation for the design wasn't universal and led to some controversy. Um, some people called it art for art's sake, um, and many in the media lamented the ever-increasing costs and delays associated with the project. In fact, one cartoon in the Sydney Morning Herald, um, drawn by Neville's, one of Neville's lecturers, George Molnar, had a picture of a group of people standing outside the Sydney Opera House, looking over its arches and saying, do they even need to build an inside? Nobody's ever going to go in there. Um, it was thought that Sydney ciders much preferred the beach to going to a concert. However, as it turns out, the building has had a large impact on Australia, um, its tourism, and it has had a large impact on Neville's life too. As Neville progressed in his studies, the controversy about the Sydney Opera House design pro project progressed too, reaching such a fever pitch as Neville was concluding his degree 
that it was decided that there would be a position advertised in public relations for the Opera House. Neville um, applied for and succeeded in acquiring this role. Um, and this experience has profoundly shaped the rest of his life. From leading him to travel and work in Europe, a study in Europe and North America, including giving lectures at Harvard and Yale. Um, it's led him to traverse the Australian outback in search of um, Indigenous artwork and capturing that for future generations, and even building a school in Kenya. The eight essays in a plan larger than I could draw explore architectural and also artistic themes in the context, though, of Neville's life as a Christian. And along the way, he traces his involvement in church projects. Um, for example, his role as the first professor of architecture at Andrews University. The book touches on matters relating to his professional life choices as a Christian academic, highlighting in particular God's leading and guidance. So these are just some of the themes that we're going to be exploring this afternoon with our panel. But I wanted to start off, Neville, by asking you, can you tell us a little bit about your reasons for writing this book? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lauren. And welcome, colleagues and friends. The book has a simple premise. There is a God, a God of love, a God who is interested in everyone's life journey. We each have a world of experiences that are very different for us each. To my mind, I see two kinds of God's leading. There is the close relationship, sharing as to a friend. Daily devotions keep the relationship alive. These are personal communications, they are meaningful, but others may want to add a healthy skepticism to these very personal experiences. But there is also a deeper level. There are a few such times that are particularly meaningful to Noreen and me, and I wanted you to come with me. As I do, I will share lots of details. The completeness of the story has also some implications. You may come to consider that these stories may be more than happy coincidences. <clears throat> the book's format is of themes or essays which give me the freedom to diverge into ways that are also part of the larger story. The book is not only about architecture. It is not a biography divided into chapters. It presents themes in a conversation. In the first essay, for example, I include a group of stories that share aspects of the theme of the Sydney Opera House and how I became involved. As you come with me in this essay, you will see that the idea of working in Scandinavia as a recent graduate from University of Sydney focused on a particular city. Everything consolidated this interest over several years. Finally, Noreen and I drove into the destination city. I went straight to the office of the Society of Architects and the secretary told me exactly what I already knew. To obtain work as a foreign architect was difficult. To find an apartment in the city was problematic. There was a high cost to register a car, etc. I came back to our car and reported a conversation to Noreen. We both knew that what I had been told was true. Then the next thought came to Noreen and to me at the same time. Let's go to Stockholm. We did not anticipate the change, but in just over the hour that we had parked in what we had believed was the destination city, we began the drive through the night to Stockholm. The unspoken message was clear, don't stop, keep going. The essay tells the story of the importance of this change in destination. It could have been a series of coincidences, but by coming with me through events and themes, you may consider that there was something more. Two and a half years later, and a world, half a world away, there was a clear message, 
slow down, stop. A roadside meeting was an appointment that we were meant to keep. The title of the book suggests that the God who is interested in each person's life journey can break through life as it is lived day by day. It can create changes in direction. One could ask why this may happen only at certain times, and rarely so. For me, if I expect the dramatic all the time, where and how would I build faith? So, David, your professional life has followed a similar trajectory to Neville's. Can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the experiences and leading that you might have experienced in these areas as a professional architect and as an artist? Um, have they been similar to Neville's and um, how do they resonate with you? Yes, well, before I answer the, the question, let me just say that um, Neville and I, the trajectory of our careers is very similar. We've both been... We're just having trouble hearing you. Can you just turn your... Uh, just move it a little bit closer to your mouth. It's on, you just need to, yeah. yeah. Can you That's hear me? Yep. A bit better? I was just about to say that um, we've, shared, we've shared many things in common. We're both architects and have practised. Um, we've both practised um, architecture on very significant, world, world, worldly, worldwide significant buildings. Um, we've both been academics. Um, we've both worked... Uh, in practices overseas, and um, we're both, and our wives, um, keen travellers. In fact, um, we, we've bumped into, we've crossed paths with Neville and Noreen in London, Amsterdam, Berrien Springs, and uh, even Detroit. Um, and Neville, for me, has been, I'm, I'm obviously a little bit younger than Neville, He's been an inspiration at a time when my parents were absolutely convinced that um, if you went to university and did something secular like architecture, you were a lost soul. Um, Neville paved the way for Adventist creatives to go to university and do things other than medicine or theology. Um, so he was an inspiration. He's been a mentor, especially when I was at the university and he was a the lecturer there. He's been my lecturer. Um, he's been my boss on multiple occasions, um, but more importantly, he's been a friend, and, and Noreen has been a friend, and our family have been friends for um, a, almost a lifetime. Um, I would like to reflect a little bit on the title of the book. Um, I, th I love the title. I think it's a great title. It appeals, of course, to an architect. Um, but I would like to help you understand the title a little bit by giving you this little, um, this, this little example. When you think of a plan, you probably think of the caricature of a plan that you might see on a television show and the, the guy's meant to be an architect and he's sitting at a drawing board or, and drawing a plan. Now that's replaced, of course, by people who drive um, computers. Um, but I'd like to give you a, an idea of what a big plan might be and that remember this is, Neville's book is about something bigger than this. The big plan is this. When I was working on Parliament House, we had, in Canberra, we had um, someone draw the entire wall, the two, of the, the two curved walls that would make up the frame of, of exactly how Parliament House fits together. And each of them is a, was half a kilometre long. And we had that drawn up, every stone that went into that, that wall. Uh, all the window details at a large scale. Sorry, jo sorry, is that better? So we had that drawn up in, in detail. It was drawn by having a huge drawing board and a roller paper on a roller and another one here and it was just passed through and it was about 20 metres long, that drawing. But that's not the biggest drawing. We felt that that wasn't enough to fully understand what those walls were going to be like. So we got surveyors to actually lay the whole wall out, half a kilometre long. Um, they did it by mapping it out in um, the, the, the um, rail shunting yards at, in Canberra. Then we hired a helicopter, flew up and had a look at what this wall was like. Now, that's a big plan. That's Neville's, a very big plan. Neville's talking about something bigger than that. 
<laughs> and, and I resonate particularly with that uh, I, because I think it's universally applicable. There's always, for every one of us, a bigger plan. Wow. I can't even imagine a plan that's 500 metres 500 meters long, but it is amazing to think that God's plan for us is even bigger than that. Well, one of the, one of the quotes that stood out, stood out to me in the book was that um, when Jorn Utzon was designing the Sydney Opera House, he had one purpose in mind for it. He said that the purpose of the Sydney Opera House was to prepare the audience for a festival. So when people looked at those um, shell vaults, he wanted them to be prepared for what was going to come inside. So I've got a question for the panel. Um, we can start off with you, Neville. Um, if you were to think about what the primary function is of a church building, what would you say that a church building is for? Well, we'd have to start with the good news. And I think it's simply sharing the gospel with all. Um, that, to me, introduces worship and mission and says it succinctly. Thank you. How about Norm or David? What, what are your thoughts? If you were to sum up what the purpose is, what would you say? Um, I'm going to start off just by the purpose would be, for me, it's inspiration. Um, this houses the gathering of the community of God, and the church exists outside of the building as well, as we are all aware. And so, the purpose of the building and facilitating the gathering for me is inspiration and inspiration to do the very things that um, Neville just mentioned. Inspiration to point us to a God of love. Inspiration to call us to worship that God of love. Inspiration to connect with one another and inspiration to go and be the church in our communities. Mm. So if I were to sum, sum it up with one word, inspiration. Inspiration. Wonderful. What about you, David? I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more specific. Uh, you say function of a church building. That could be any, any religion, any church building. I'm going to address what I see as the primary function of a Seventh-day Adventist church building uh, without repeating what Neville and Norman have said. Um, for me, the most important part of worship on Sabbath is the Sabbath school lesson study. And you've always got to have a good trip. And I see most of E14 is here. And that, that was a, a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath school when I was part of that. I haven't been part of it for a few years. And I noticed that um, a lot of you have changed uh, quite a bit in those few years. Um, but the Sabbath school, provision of space, adequate space for all of the Sabbath schools, is one of the primary functions of getting a decent Seventh-day Adventist church going. Um, Beyond that, I would also add that the church building says something about the people who've built it and occupy it. And it ought to be, to God's honour and glory, it ought to be the best building that we can possibly do. So that it says the right thing to the community. I like that perspective. It certainly does make a difference when every group has a little space that they can call their own to study God's word together. Um, a space that's suited to what that group's needs are. Um, so, Neville, I believe that you've got some examples of churches to show us, some slides. Um, would you like to show us a couple of examples of churches and how um, they've been designed to enhance certain aspects of the worship experience? Be happy to do this. And we ask your creativity here because I don't have a clicker. And so I'm going to have to ask for the first slide and then we sort of raise my hand and go on from there. This shows the path to Thorn Crown Chapel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. The path to the chapel follows the same route that the workmen used to carry the four by twos and the larger timbers onto the site. There was care not to make changes to the natural environment. And so as we approach this chapel, we come to the chapel door. And in the book, I paired two illustrations. One 
is the architect's section which shows the simplicity of the church. And you see that both in, in plan and here you see it in section or elevation. And I paired that in the book with the photograph inside the chapel. Thanks, Leighton. And I was very pleased to see that Shane Winfield of Science Publishing took this building, in fact, provided an alternative of a cover. And this is the cover that was used, which, of course, is the interior, the celebration of Thorn Crown Chapel. The chapel is for meditation. It's for remembering a life. And as you enter, recorded organ music plays. And so you feel this sense of inspiration, certainly. The building is on my list of 10 best buildings in the 20th century anywhere. So you see, I have an appreciation for both the church and the architect. While the two workmen were carrying the four by twos, we'll just go through a few more illustrations of the interior here. That's the next one. Okay, and we come to another, in fact, a church plan. As these two workmen were carrying their four by twos along the path to build the Thorn Crown Chapel, there was a very different project going on in New York City. This one was built with steel and concrete. There was an existing church on the site where City Corp was going to build its corporate headquarters. And this church had to be replaced. And so the development plan by City Corp included a new church. St. Hugh Stubbins designed the new St. Peter's Lutheran Church. It's a good neighbor to the surroundings and a change in geometric form sets it apart from the towering rectilinear buildings for banking and commerce. It's hold its, it holds its own on the commercial site. While dwarfed by the City Corp Tower, the new church is in scale with a gathering place where people stop, communicate, and rest in the outdoors. From the street, a passerby can see into the worship space and hear the service. And from inside, you see that wall that creates the connection between the exterior and interior. The church is in the world and for the world, but it preserves its integrity. And David, I believe that you have a couple of examples to show us too about um, churches that have been designed to enhance certain aspects of worship. Would you like to talk to us about those? Certainly. Can we have the next, can we have the next slide? This is a, a church, well, it's, it's a St Thomas Aquinas church. After I finished working on Parliament House, they gave me this church to design. It's a Roman Catholic church. And um, I hope... I hope you can see it adequately because there's a couple of things that architecture can do that Neville has spoken about um, and that we spoke about when we were designing Hillview Church, which I'll come to in a moment, um, to enhance what happens, to make sure that when you get into your seat, you're ready for, for something worthwhile. You're ready for a worship experience. So I want to just talk briefly about itinerary, address, and maybe a little bit about symbolism. Next one. Okay, so this is um, a, a, the point where you enter the church. Um, I think this is really, really significant. I've, I was asked to look at a church recently where they said, we need to do something about this church. It's, it's um, not, not suiting our needs. The first problem I saw was that the cars parked up hard against the church. And it was like looking at a, a, a shopping centre across all the rooftops of the cars. There was no sense of how you came to the church. Here, you can come to the church. It's, it's a, a suburban church in, in Canberra. Uh, you can come to the church either way into that, that um, space that's now shaded red. 
And there's a little bit of symbolism there. There's 12 columns, freestanding columns. The building on the right-hand side is the uh, parish centre where the priest lived and, and other things happened. And by way of joining them and making an entrance, there's this courtyard with the 12 apostles. They're, f they're 12 donated hue and pine columns uh, with some inscriptions on them. From there, so you've come into what is the precinct of the building. You're not in the building, but you've, you've approached it from your car. You've left the world behind and you've come into the precinct of the church. So it's the beginning of an itinerary that's preparing you to worship. Next. Then you go through a little foyer. It's, a, it's like a venturi. If anyone's ever tuned a motorbike carburetor, you'll know what a venturi is. It's where the, the, the carburetor necks down and then opens up so that as the fuel goes through, it's reduced, speeds up, the space it goes through is sped up, and then it expands, ready to be burnt in the, in, the, uh, in the cylinder. This is like that. It makes people go, it's a bit like the Japanese tea ceremony. Sorry, that better? It's a little bit like the Japanese tea ceremony where you're, you're made to be humble and then you open up into the space as you, as you go forward. Now, the next. Okay, so now you, you come through that restriction and then you, you're introduced to the, the main body of the church, which is a big volume, beautifully designed. And this is a circulation space that allows people to come in and move around without disturbing those who are already seated. Next. So there's the, there's the sanctuary. By the time you get there, you should be ready, basically, to take up your seat and be prepared for a sacred experience. And then the next area is where there's a lot of symbolism. If you're a Roman Catholic, you'll understand it. Um, but that's seen not only in the plan, but also in this elevation um, the, main, the main elevation, the only really big elevation which faces the, the community and they can see the symbols of what that church is all about. Um, next. So this is, this is where you went. This is the courtyard that, that, that you enter, the 12 apostles, and then you're invited in because of the shape of the building to the rest of the itinerary. So it has a good address and a good itinerary. Next. You'll, you'll all know Hillview Church. This is one where Neville was the architect. We collaborated on this one. Um, the drawings were done in my terrace house in Cooks Hill, if you remember coming there frequently, Neville. Um, and one of the things that Neville was instrumental in making me conscious of was this question of itinerary. So if we can just flick through this. You approach by road through that beautiful treed area. No cars, you're not looking over cars. You look through the trees to the church and you see the main symbolic element of the church as you approach it so you know it's a church straight away. Then you move into the car park which is removed from the church and from the car park. You next come into the... If we can keep going one more. You come into a courtyard. So you're now again within the precinct of the church. You're, you're rubbing up against the church, not yet in it. So it's gradually preparing you for, for the service. Keep going. A foyer large enough for people to shake out their umbrellas and finish talking about the new car they bought this week. And then through this little venturi, Neville, Neville put a, a heavy beam, and he refers, I think it's referred to in the book, a heavy beam that lowers the ceiling as you come into the church and then opens up to the church, the big experience. You know you've arrived at the sanctuary. Next. So there's the sanctuary and one more. When it was first designed, um, church services in Adventist churches were a bit different and it's based on 50 years ago what we were doing. So there was two levels, one for the Sabbath school, one for the formal church seats for the people who were leading out in the service. Um, the emblems of the foot washing uh, were included so that there was some symbolism that said this is a Seventh-day Adventist church and reminded people of, of how we do worship. Thank you very much for sharing those slides. It was very interesting to get those little tours and glimpses into a couple of different ways where architects have helped us to have different worship experiences in quite different environments from 
a forest to the middle of New York City, um, to small small towns and suburban areas. So um, this morning I was worshipping over across the way in the university church, and Norm, you're the pastor there in this impressive building. Um, has the design of that church building, Avondale University Church, impacted the way that you do ministry at all? Um, what what impression does it make on you when you walk in there for worship and how do you think it impacts different people in your congregation? Great question. And yes, certainly I think the design of the building does have an impact on what it facilitates, what it conjures or, or creates, evokes in the minds and the feelings of people. Now, when you ask the story of the university church building, you get many interesting tales and, um, I guess, observations about how it came to be the building that it is. Um, I'm new to the, to the building, and certainly when you approach it, it is quite an impressive, quite a big structure. I believe part of why it was built was to facilitate a big pipe organ, which isn't there, which raises some interesting questions about, you know, architecture and facilitating a certain function that maybe isn't happening at the moment yet when other people walk in without any of that knowledge a lot of the quest a lot of the observation that I've heard is that wow the big high frontage is awe-inspiring it is um so that's some of the comments that I've heard and I think it's certainly Lift up my eyes to look at the windows up there at the top when I yep. walked in. Mm. And it certainly evokes that. Then some afternoons, you have to be here in the afternoon when the sun is setting in the west and you go into, into the building and the light is streaming through those windows. It is, it is quite inspiring. Even just to sit and look at the patterns it makes on the floor, you know, to reflect and think about what the symbolism of... of the stained glass is but then also when everyone is gathered and everyone is there worshiping together what that evokes as well and and what that the feeling of connectedness togetherness the oneness that that facilitates with the design in the way it all wraps around and you sort of feel you're you're part of and involved in something unique something amazing as a pastor and as, as church members, we all know that churches are more than just the buildings that we worship. Um, a church is the people that worship in it. But ro what role do you see church buildings have in the way that we be the church um, to the communities around us? Yep. That is a very good question and one that I'd love for us to continue to discuss and ponder um, as we go. But it all comes down to the answer you, or what you believe the, the purpose of church is, or the purpose of, um, diff even different Christian traditions have different ideas of what is the ultimate purpose of church. If you come from a Calvinistic background, it would be the worship, or the, you know, sola deo gloria, to the glory of God alone, that is, His sovereignty is, is ultimately what sits behind everything they do, and so in that context, the more majestic, the more grandeur, the more um, it can evoke those kinds of feelings of emotions, the better. We come from, I guess, a, a, a faith concept where we lean into the God of love. And love talks about intimacy and connection. And we look at the story of the Bible where God instructs Moses to I guess, design or gives him the design for the first temple or the, the sanctuary and says, the purpose of this is for me to be with my people. So what is that togetherness, that intimacy, that a God of love, how can that be facilitated in the gathering of the people? But then if we lean into our, our Adventist heritage as well, we here, we're, we exist for mission. And the gathering the gathering of the community is there to inspire and facilitate mission around the world. So how do we construct buildings that facilitate that reality as well? So, de yeah, depending on sort of your picture or concept of God and the, and the mission that you embrace, embrace as a church community, it can have a huge impact on how you design 
and construct your buildings. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Did, you, did either of you want to jump in with any comments there? Good. <laughs> no? All right. Well, we'll move on. Thank you for those comments, Pastor Norm. Um, one of the criticisms that I mentioned earlier in the, my introduction to this panel was that when the Sydney Opera House was being built, some people criticised it as being art for art's sake. Um, in reflecting on church buildings, do you think that there's any justification sometimes in having art for art's sake in church buildings? <clears throat> well, I think we could go to an example where um, one could call the building a piece of sculpture and it's art for art's sake. And that's in the mid 50s. Um, do we have the first slide again, please? Yeah, this is the approach to the doorway of Ronchamp Pilgrimage Chapel. The architect is Le Cabussier, uh, a French Swiss man. He created the ceramics here to the doorway. And it's interesting that in his normal day at the office, he would spend the morning doing art and the afternoon he would turn to architecture. I think so often we think of it the other way around, but he was so, art was so important to him. And the next slide shows you the general picture of this. So it was a pilgrimage chapel, certainly for the Roman Catholic community, but um, it turned out to be a pilgrimage chapel for architects. We all turned up there in the, as soon as we could after the mid-50s. So this church broke the tenet that you could not have art for art's sake. In other words, you could have it. And the next important building to break that rule, the mold, was the Sydney Opera House. Do you want to add anything to... One thing that I'd... I would share in that, and this was more personal story and experience, not so much about the architecture um, background, because I don't have much in that, but experiencing a certain environment um, which had taken on symbolism for symbolism's sake, um, sake but wasn't really... I, I look at the, the list of the seven... What do you call them there? Seven filters for identifying appropriate church architecture. And one is environment, human activities, climate, cost, society, culture, symbolism. And this is an example of where I feel someone got the symbolism and the climate and environment the wrong way around. Where a church was built in South Africa, a small, tiny church, and it had that three-tiered symbolism of, you know, holy, well, the, the gathering, the holy place, the most holy place. And so as the pastor, you're on the rostrum sitting right up here at the top of the ceiling in this tiny little church where there's no airflow or windows at all in the middle of Africa. And so there was beautiful symbolism about, and you know, communicating different aspects about, I guess, the, the, the biblical picture or the, or the temple we see in the Bible, but no consideration to the climate or the environment, and it was an absolute nightmare to try and share and present um, and didn't inspire when you were in that space. So, yeah. Sometimes art for art's sake goes wrong. Well, that, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> correct. It's not, it's not symbolism if it's not working properly. Um, I, I think there's two, two kinds of art um, when we're talking about, particularly talking about architecture. There's a necessary art that's necessary for the completion of the architecture. The architecture without it doesn't work. You imagine the mosques without the blue tiles. They would not be a mosque. They would not, not be a Muslim mosque. Um, in my my favourite, all-time favourite buildings are the Gothic cathedrals of England and Europe. I've been to every single one of them and I never tire of going and paying a visit to them. They're, they're loaded with art. But that art is symbolic. It was a language that the parishioners understood at a time when they couldn't read. And it was necessary as a means of communicating and reminding them of the gospel, particularly the stained glass windows, but even the, the, uh, the gargoyles that look ghastly, etc. That's necessary art. 
there's also a gratuitous art, and um, well, and that's self-explanatory. Yes. While this church was um, establishing a new basis um, in, ch in terms of church design, meanwhile, in Finland, they were happily pursuing its traditions of timber construction. And so the next example is the Otanimi Chapel, and this I deal with quite a bit in the book, because you have this sequence of being in the forest, leaving the forest, this five steps, one, two, three, four, five, you're in the courtyard, you're close to the bell tower, and then you go to the, the church, and the next slide shows us the, um, the ceiling or the, the trusses, bearing in mind that there's a reason for this, because if you have um, an area of glass one and a half times the size of the area of glass behind the pulpit and the other piece of furniture, you won't have a glare on the furniture, you'll have a glare up above the congregation's head. So that achieves that very well. And the next slide shows it in winter. So this is the Otanimi Chapel by Kaya and Heike Siren, husband and wife team. It was built in 1957, so we're dealing again with the mid-50s. It was destroyed by fire and was rebuilt as originally built in 1978. How beautiful. Can you imagine worshipping with that view outside? How beautiful. Wow. Well, moving on from, from the design of church buildings, your book also has a lot to say about your work with Aboriginal, uh, with Aboriginal artwork um, and its preservation using photogrammetry. I'm going to stumble over that word. Photogrammetric techniques. Now, a lot of us might not know what that is. Um, can you explain to us a little bit about what photogrammetry is <laughs> and um, how does it relate to architecture? Oh, I thought we'd left architecture for a while. That's good. <laughs> photogrammetry is the science of taking measurements from photographs and it's the basis for um, fields such as geodesy and aerial mapping. At the Ohio State University with a research professor, I made measured drawings of historic buildings in New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C. And so basically in photogrammetry, you're having a visual model of, in this case, terrestrial photogrammetry, a visual model of what was actually seen by the camera when you were on the site. I applied the principles to recording Australian Aboriginal art and I described the plotting of rock shelters of art which was done at the police headquarters in Sydney. I need to describe a plotting machine for you and it's, it's a situation that completely immerses you. Your head is against a rest and so your eyes are very active in surveying this model that you're looking at, the stereoscopic model. But you have in front of you two steering wheels. There is the steering wheel to the right hand, which moves a measuring mark left or right, the horizontal. Actually, it doesn't move the measuring mark at all. What it does is to move the model, and it appears as if the measuring mark, this little dot, it appears that you're moving it. Okay. On the left-hand side, you have a steering wheel, and this moves the dot vertically. So you can now move the dot, or appear to move the dot, in the X and Y direction. Well, what about depth? Well, there's a big disc on the floor, and by kicking the desk one way and bringing back the other way, you're moving that measuring mark in and out. So you've got the three dimensions by two hands and a foot, you're um, following that measuring mark. And if you're taking contours of the landscape or um, Aboriginal rock engravings, the, the uh, caves, you're moving this dot and able to measure from it. Well, there is something to do with your left foot, and that is to press a button on the floor 
which will drop a pencil onto dimensionally stable malar. So here you've got the, the basis of taking photographs in the site, in this case, the bush of um, North Cape York, and you're moving this model, which is scaled because when you were there, you had some pieces of tape on the shelter with a very price, precise mark. You measured that exactly, and you can now put the scale into the model, and so you have a true scale model of what you want to photograph, what you want to plot, and, and so that's the way it is. So let's look at a couple of slides here. This is the particular shelter I refer to. This is Possum Gallery. And uh, you bend down to get underneath this, but then it opens up into a voluminous space. Here we're inside, and we can see the stereometric camera over there in the, towards the outside of the shelter. But you can start to see a bit of the eight meters of the snake that's curling around above you and on the wall and so on. So this is a fairly good challenge, and that's what I um, took the challenge to do, and I finished that project in Switzerland. So, so when you took photos of, of those um, engravings, that meant that if anything were to happen to that cave in the future, if there was a rock slide or a landslide or continued erosion over time, that means that through those photos we would essentially have a model um, that we could um, look back on and say um, how big those um, individual engravings were and where they were located within the cave. Is that, is that correct? That, that is true. Um, but in particular, the first project I did with the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies was at Mutwinji. And there, the surfaces of the rock, the tilted rock surfaces, were subjected even back then, we're talking about the early 1970s, they were being um, destroyed by the temperature changes in the outback. And so um, we went back there within the last 12 months to find that basically all the work that I had done had been destroyed. Wow. But um, th this is another reason why it's important. And this, um, maybe it sounds a bit esoteric, but if you have a group of prehistorians and art historians come to one of these shelters, they will try to translate what they think they see on the wall onto gridded paper. I say that what they think they see because they already have decided that, oh, this must be um, a freshwater cro crocodile. And so, the problem is that if you bring that conclusion as you're recording the art, it doesn't leave room to actually uncover what the real inside story would be. So with photogrammetry, I could provide um, prehistorians and archaeologists, anthropologists, with a plotting that was much more objective. They could take that to the, the shelter and the plotting wouldn't show, I, I hadn't decided when I was plotting this animal what it was, whether it was a koala, for example. Um, if it came out to be like that according to the drawing, then that's fine. But it was, it was going a step back and being more objective. So it actually affected the whole of the um, writing on Aboriginal art. You know, you've got the eight volumes coming out of um, a German product and it's very complicated and uh, they take small changes and make it very important so it becomes important for scientific conferences and, and journals but it may not be close to what the Aboriginal artists were actually doing when they did the work themselves. The last of this sequence, I think, oh no, this is a plotting. So this is straight from the plotting machine and it shows contours, um, again, using that measuring mark to float across the top of the surfaces and it also shows um, emu 
um, figures with eggs and uh, crocodiles and even a um, human form there. So that's the the interest from Cape York, and I came across this hunter, the hunter with the bush turkey and the fish, and that became a symbol for me. I just loved it so much, um, the artistic quality and the fact that it was part of the, the dreamings of that Aboriginal culture. It's very interesting to see those and to think that so few people have got the chance to go and visit them, but um, as a result of that work, we can see that today. Um, David, as an artist, do you have any thoughts to share about, about this process or about the significance of this work? Um, the the um, interesting thing for me about architecture is that it's 50% art, 50% science. And that's, a, for me, a really wonderful mix. Um, it's why I'm not an accountant. Um, probably why I'm not a chemist either, um, or even a physicist, or a the theologian. I've got a foot in both of those camps, and both of them are great things to, to be involved, involved with. The Aboriginal art provokes some thought about how different types of worship buildings might be suited to different types of people. Um, so, uh, Norm, how would, you, how would you see the way that church buildings accommodate or support different types of people's experiences in worship? So, for example... Um, you mentioned that the <laughs> the building in South Africa, which elevated the pastor, was not very was not a suitable experience for worship. Are there other situations that you can think of where church buildings might help or hinder the worship experience of different demographics? Yeah, I certainly believe that the environment has a huge impact on how people can be or how they feel in a certain space. And and reading through Neville's book, it became very clear as we saw the, the architect of the Sydney Opera House, his intention was to design a building to elicit an experience and to make people feel they're coming into a festive environment. For some of us who've grown up in a context where we understand a God of love and that's a, a, a desirable being, um, coming into a big grandeuristic building can be awe-inspiring. Mm -hmm. I've also met some people who are coming into a building like that for the first time and it's overwhelming and intimidating mm. and they, they, they cringe back and, and feel lost in that space. Um, then there's, and so for me, a lot of that plays into one, people's backgrounds, sometimes they're, they're different natures or temperaments and so often the environment of a worship setting influences whether they feel welcomed or belong in that space. In, in the journey of theology and understanding human beings, I've come to realize that um, there's a book I encountered by Gary Thomas. He writes The Five Love Languages. He talks about sacred pathways where we as human beings, we see and engage with God differently. And he mentions nine, and I'll just quickly go through. He mentions activists, ascetists, caregivers, contemplatives, enthusiasts, intellectual, naturalists, sensates, and traditionalists. And when you look at, and each of those depending on, and you're not one or the other, obviously there's multiple expressions of all of those, but your ascetists and your sensates would probably be far more appreciative of a big grandeuristic building and feel awe-inspired with that, whereas probably your, your caregivers and, and activists, that wouldn't really have such an impact on them. And so rather they'd want to be out amongst people doing various things. And so I think it does have an impact and engages people differently. Mm. And it's always interesting to be aware and seeing how are people responding to the space and environment um, that they're coming into. Yeah, great. Uh, perspectives from the two of you? Can we have the next slide? Thank you. So just following on uh, from the question of how you design churches to make people feel 
what they should feel. Um, different, and they have different, they all have different needs and different perceptions. Um, one of the things that has, has happened is that Adventist worship, and not just Adventist worship, Christian worship, um, has changed dramatically in the last few decades um, to the point where for some churches all they need is a tin shed with blacked out everything, smoke generators and, you know, lights, etc. How many Adventist churches have you been to recently where all the windows have been blinded off because we were just working with technology? Well, this, this is Hillview Church, and I'd just like to point out a few things that have changed in the 50 years since Neville and I worked on this, this building, the design of this building. Um, and it's all to do basically with technology. Um, the lighting in the church now is a, a light bar. I'm sure they'd like an even bigger light bar. Um, the speakers are specially chosen now to behave in a certain way. Um, those things were never designed into the design, never part of the church design that weren't needed in those days, weren't even thought were appropriate. Uh, didn't want it to look like a theatre, that kind of attitude. Um, so that's one thing. The other, you'll notice the white scrim hangings. That's something that I recently did. I did that towards the end of last year because the people who uh, do the camera work for um, putting the church stuff on YouTube and for live streaming were complaining that their automatic focusing cameras kept focusing on the strict hard lines of the brickwork at the expense of the preacher's face. And, you know, they just didn't like it. So someone hung up a big velvet red curtain that looked like a French boudoir, not a church. Um, and um, my wife was very concerned about it and she said, David, you've got to do something about it. I said, I'm not interested. But she said, well, I'm going to talk. And eventually I was asked to do something about it. And that's what these hangings are. They're a scrim. So you still see the brickwork, which was part of the intention. But at the same time, it softens, the, softens them enough that the cameras are now, are now happy. So that's another, another one. And the, uh, the last one I was just going to mention, sorry, Neville. The last one I was going to mention just briefly, you'll notice the little squares on the uprights holding the seat backs up. It's just little white squares. The, f the photo is not sufficiently clear, but they're those, um, what are they called? Yeah, thanks. QR codes. We don't take up the offering in the normal way. It's become an embarrassment, you know, because the poor old deacons are going around passing the thing and no one, everyone's doing their offering online. And just in case you forget, you can use the QR code and do it on the spot. So things have changed dramatically. When we designed that church, the seat layout, uh, never will remember this, the seat layout is predicated on being able to um, and not, not having any more than four people from an aisle so that the deacons could pass the emblems without too much problem from either aisle. So eight was the maximum number of seats in a row. Now, that doesn't matter. They go down to the front and receive the emblems. The offering is not taken up in the way it used to be. Um, so it, things have changed. When, when, when it was first designed, as I mentioned previously, there was two levels, one for the Sabbath school program, one for the, uh, the formal church service. Nowadays at Hillview, there's no, no preliminaries. Everyone just goes to Sabbath school class for the duration. So things have changed very much uh, in the last, uh, the last 50 years. So much thought and, and consideration. I think the, the non-architects, Norm and I, on this panel are learning a lot. We wouldn't have thought that... There was such significance to just having eight seats in the in the row. That's amazing, isn't it? Um, please continue on. I think. Did you have some more to share, David? No. Did you have some more to share? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Um, okay. Well, given that there are so many. Um, I guess different perspectives and different ways that people experience worship buildings. Um, what are some of the ways that we can best involve church members when a new church is being designed? Um, how does that, what are some of the ideal ways that a design process can move forward? 
I would like to begin with the basis for designing. In the book, I include the story of a man in an enclosure at the London Zoo. The sign at the front of the exhibit read, Urban Man, Homo Sapiens Urbanus. This male is called Alberto Vidal. He is on loan. We, the spectators, were fascinated with Alberto. He didn't say a word. He read and snacked in a comfortable chair, changed into his pajamas and brushed his teeth at the wash basin, lay on the bed, changed from pajamas, sat at the breakfast table and pedaled an exercise bike. He then returned to the living room and turned on the hi-fi. This was Alberto at home. We can see that it's easy to add a wall of privacy, provide protection from the sun and rain, and make a sheltered place to live for this actor as he goes from one of the various home settings located in this enclosure on the grass. But this does not provide meaning. It does not tell us what it means to dwell. I introduce the story of finding a Swedish rock blood at the Museum of Åland Islands between Sweden and Finland. I tell how it adds the importance to dwell. This cultural icon combines the analysis of human activities with meaning. And we'll go on from Umberto in the enclosure at the London Zoo and more. Yeah, this is the Orland Museum and you'll see that underneath this wagon are these wonderful little figures and they're the rock blood and this is the one that was made for us. So this adds a little bit of meaning to what's in the book. The diagram of the design process that Pastor um, has referred to as a general reference to creativity is applied to church architecture. I like the writings of Ottilie Stafford who suggests that the participation with the creator in the creative process is itself a form of worship. She goes on to say, worship involves experience and expressions quite apart from the practical, utilitarian, rational expressions of our ordinary life. The title of Ottilie's paper is appropriately The Holiness of Beauty, Why Imaginations Matter. I suggest that everyone who is willing to participate in creating places of worship should do so. The poet, philosopher, physicist, soup kitchen worker, and high school student, all of these can share visionary and most unexpected ideas in the design process. There are many ways that an architect can lead in creating environments for worship to meet the needs of the worshipers. One way is to be very open in the way a workshop can bring a congregation together in a creative endeavor. User participation workshops can include things like an awareness walk, worship, a collection of everyday objects, cutouts and color patches from magazines to give mood, cereal squares for desks, parsley for vegetation. I include here an example of a user participation workshop at Pacific Palisades in California. St. Matthew's Episcopal Church, the next slide please, and 86 neighboring houses were destroyed by fire in 1978. Almost immediately a building committee was formed and members interviewed three architects. The firm chosen was Charles Moore and Associates. They suggested a user participation workshop and church members met for two days in a tent on the site. An awareness walk on the first morning created a real interest in a small area with shrubs, which was the only part of the site that had been preserved. It was, dedicated, it was decided that this would be a prayer garden and you see it here. It became the center for outdoor fellowship. And so as they developed this project in a two-day workshop, you'll see how it developed. 
This is the trellis that provides the extension of entry as you coming in to the church. And this is in the church and the focus of the front of the church. Thank you. I like, I like the way that um, the community recognised the potential of that area and developed it into that prayer garden to complement the new design. It's very meaningful, isn't it? Um, well, Neville, one of the aspects you cover in the book as well is um, your work as the, in helping to establish the, pro the architecture program at Andrews University, um, which I believe was the first Christian architecture course in North America. Is that correct? First Adventist course in, ad in Christian architecture. Um, can you tell us about how the program has gone over the intervening years since it was started? Um, what's been its main contribution, do you think, to our church? Sure. In essay number seven, I talk about Andrews University, but I limit myself to talking about the students, their creativity, and design workshops. Because the rest of it is all part of gaining accreditation during six years and being, in fact, the only program in North America that was accredited as a new program in the 1980s. So we received full accreditation for five years and the accrediting board knew that we knew what to do and that we would do it. The mission of the architecture program at Andrews is still strong. Students participate in both local and overseas projects. I was recently visiting Critic via Zoom with Andrews University master's students in a project for an orphanage in Eswatini, Africa. Both David and I can speak to the value of student projects that focus on design for human activities, cultures and climates that are different to a university home setting. Architectural education centers around the studio. I have approached the process of designing as it makes sense to non-architecture and first-year architecture students. I want every student to understand the importance of creativity and regardless of how creative the student is, I want there to be an understanding and respect for creativity in all professions. At the end of an architecture program, there is a closer link to a masterclass and the apprenticeship tradition. David accepted the position of visiting professor at Andrews and Lawrence Tech, leading masterclasses, including one in Paris. This is where David has excelled, teaching architectural design at the University of Newcastle by implementing masterclasses with outstanding architects. Is there anything you'd like to add there, David? No. They're always a lot of fun. Well. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the other stories in the book is a fascinating story. Um, it's about how uh, Neville and his wife, Noreen, came to start a school in a small village in Western, Western Kenya, I believe. Western, yes. Um, and so... So this is quite a different project to some of the other projects that you've been working on, Neville. Um, perhaps one where the budget is smaller, but the needs are still great. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to work on a project like this and how it might have differed from some of the other work that you've done? Several African projects that I had been involved with up until a certain point remained projects on paper. They had one thing in common, they were connected to the field of architecture and hospital development. They were large projects, and except for some minor achievements, the dreams did not see the light of day. Ten years after I thought my excursions to Africa had ceased, an opportunity came to me from an individual in Africa who reached out to get my attention. I was not looking for an involvement and almost missed becoming involved. What this is how the story of faith, at that stage, a 12-year-old orphan girl began. The year was 2010, and that became very important. In fact, Brian and Beverly 
Tim's were with us when we first went to the first opening of the first classrooms there. For the past decade, Noreen and I have shared the dreams of a local community in Western Kenya to help them build a school for orphans and disadvantaged children. The village is Rapogi Luanda. Since 2013, more buildings have been added each year. Now there are nine classrooms, an early childhood education cottage, a dormitory for orphans, teacher's cottage, dining hall and new kitchen, and on a site nearby, a vocational school and a large area for agriculture. We thank the many donors and the organization Maranatha International for drilling a deep well. The local community, oh, here you see the students working in the workshop, they've produced all their own desks and chairs and tables for the school. And the next, this is the new dining hall, the largest building on the site and the kitchen is to the right hand end. And this is the space in the new kitchen. When you consider the contrast between this and the bush kitchen that had served them for the first 11 years of life, it is just amazing what is happening there. There are five principles which have guided the partnering between overseas and local communities. And I'll go through these five because I think they're important. They, they're in contrast to the typical brief or program that would be given to an architect. And so this is how we saw it. One, an underlying sensitivity, expanding the familiar maxim of think locally, act globally. Think and act locally and globally with sensitivity and care. Two, recognition that human capital, local knowledge, skills, experience, and creativity is just as important as financial assistance. Three, a focus on small projects that can easily achieve and succeed. Four, an emphasis on sustainability. For example, a solar bakery, all under the umbrella of local community ownership, and we see that as vitally important. Thanks, Neville. We've spoken a lot today about architecture and even art, um, but your book, A Plan Larger Than I Can Draw, is more than just these areas. Um, it describes God's leading in your life, um, we often think about pastors and teachers as being called to their professions, um, but this book has a lot to say, I think, about the calling of people to other, particularly to creative professions. Um, what do you think? What do you think about that? Um, perhaps we can start with you, Pastor Nom. Yeah, I think every vocation is a vocation that celebrates, honors, and worships our God. More and more, we we embracing that idea and I love that this book highlights that we the language that people are communicating or connecting with these days is the language of arts and more and more we need more people that feel that calling and have a space in our church environments to live that calling out um, so that we can creatively communicate God's story absolutely yep how about you David or Neville yeah just to, just reflecting on the opportunities that, and, and the leading in, in, uh, that, that materialised and the way God led in Neville's life. I found that in my own. Architecture is not a stable profession. You have to go where the work is. It's not like being a, a doctor and people come to you and it's a regular small payment. And it's, you know, if provided you've got a town with a certain number, you'll have work forever. Architecture is not like that. And Neville's book shows clearly that he was given opportunities and managed to, to, to take them. Um, and um, I think there is another, another aspect of, of this as well. Of the, the, the church has never really dealt particularly well with creative folk. It's much better at it now, but it, it's still got a ways to go. But people like Neville and myself have found ourselves 
in company of people who would never, ever admit an Adventist through their front door. Um, on one occasion, uh, when I was working in London, uh, in one of the world's biggest firms, they had one and a half thousand architects working for them. I was stood up and I was, I was asked to come into the middle of the office and one of the senior people there, this is in a huge, huge office, um, there was nearly 500 people there and in a very loud voice he asked, after a liquid lunch, he asked, do you believe this rubbish about God? And that went for three quarters of an hour and the whole office heard what was being said. Now that was an opportunity that was just not available Absolutely. otherwise. On another occasion, uh, Sir Andrew Derbyshire, who was, one of the, who was the partner in charge of the project I was working on, and who for some reason thought I was okay, decided if, when he was travelling to look at the project we were working on that I would go with him as his chauffeur and uh, advisor because he'd lost his licence driving under the influence. And he was very, very interested in hearing my Christian beliefs. He would never have heard them otherwise. That's so true. God needs people everywhere. There are people who can't be, who can't have any opportunities to hear about him except if a Christian is there in that environment. Right. Well, our final question today goes to you, Neville. If there's one thing that you hope that people take away from reading this book, what, it, what would it be? Well, I began by talking about the daily walkers about relationships and to this I added, for me, faith is needed to connect with the unexpected at certain times. I believe there are times when Christians may know that they are in the right place at the right time. It would be wonderful to know this all the time, but God ordains that it is not so. The existence of faith is fundamental to the Christian life amid the turbulence of the world's ocean of events and ideas. Noreen and I had no idea that one or two experiences of uncertainty and serious concern lay ahead. It was those points in the journey that faith carried us through. I finished the last essay on homecoming with these thoughts. The philosophical focus to life is to dwell, to be at home. To come home is about location and being united with family and friends. To dwell is more than a country, town, street number, and mailbox. To dwell is important because it is of the mind and the heart. The Dutch architect Aldo van Eyck summarized his thoughts on design in this way. Architecture can do no more and must not do less than assist one's homecoming. Meaningful journeys are just like that and involve a homecoming. For life, there is another homecoming that is important because of its spiritual relevance to us all. For us all, life journeys can do no more and should do no less than assist our homecoming. Amen. Well, thank you, Neville. We hope that, that has whetted your appetite to read A Plan Larger Than I Could Draw if you haven't done so already. Um, we do have copies at the back, so you are very welcome to grab one on, the, on your way out. They're available today on an honour system, so you can take one today and you can arrange payment after Sabbath. There are some details in the front of the book um, about bank transfer, or if you prefer to pray in person, um, you can take your book and the little brochure that's inside down to Better Books and Food. Um, they're open um, from 10 till 3 tomorrow. You can go there and also during the week. Um, and for our online audience, people who are watching online, um, a discount is also available to you. Um, if you would like to purchase the book from the Adventist Book Centre web store, um, which is www.adventistbookcentre.com.au, you can enter the discount code FORUM at checkout and you will receive the same discount that's available um, to people today. So thank you so much for all being here today. It's been a pleasure um, to be with you to talk about Neville's book and to see it launched out to a broader audience. Um, we very much enjoyed at Science Publishing working with you on the project, Neville. Um, and we hope that it inspires more people to think about the ways that God can lead them um, to make a difference in this world, um, not only through um, traditional ministry roles, but in other professions too. 
So would you join me in closing in prayer today? Father in heaven, thank you so much for your leading in Neville's life. Um, we can see that as he worked um, as an architect, as he worked as an academic, as an artist, um, you had a plan for him that was larger than anything that he thought of. He has made impacts um, in this world which he would not have dreamed. And this is something that you want to do for each one of us. Father, you can use us wherever we are. And so I pray for each person here, each person watching online, um, and for the people that we interact with, that as we read Neville's book and reflect on the themes that it holds, you would help us to know that you desire to lead us and that you will continue to work out your plans if we, if we follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for being here with us today. And um, if you would like Neville to sign a copy of your book, I'm sure he'd be happy to do so on the way out. With us today. And um, if you would like Neville to sign a copy.